know, it's great to be here and uh, look forward to interactions today. So um, I've got um, seven distinguished uh, faculty panelists up here. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll, you know, you'll, you'll meet each of them along the way. So, and they'll introduce themselves as they go. With that, we just get started. It's a pleasure to talk to you all. Um, I even had, um, you know, what, what I had somebody just came up to me from UBC, and is my PhD student, who's a, a full professor there, her name is Tiz Molina, and uh, said, oh, he's now supervising this student, so I have a, I have a grand student. <laughs> here we go. <laughs> and uh, it, it's a pleasure to be here. So let me just jump right in. Um, and, you know, even like Bob said, I'm going to talk about finance and competition, and that's been my whole, generally the big theme of most of all of my work. A couple of exceptions, but most nearly all of it. One of the things I would say is a piece of, small piece of advice is it's good to do things that are somewhat in interdisciplinary. Um, first is, that's not done as much. And one would say, well, finance and economics, it's not that interdisciplinary. If you read some of the literatures, very few people talk to each other across finance and economics, even if they're working on similar topics like mergers. That's not always true, but all I'm saying is there is, in fact, a lot of rooms for talking with folks. And I've also done some work with people in strategy departments at business schools. So that's one of the small tips I would say, is look beyond your silo and think about, you know, going something a little broader. We might have different audiences. It also gives you more outlets for your papers, which is another small thing always to think about. All right, so let's just jump right in. I'm going to have a quick, I'm going to have a lot of pictures here. So, you know, if pictures worth a, worth a, a thousand words, I'm going to try to do more pictures. So my point is that same interdisciplinary uh, topic, you know, is that finance uh, needs to, corporate finance, I'm going to focus on this matter of, of work. Uh, they need to expand in some ways and think about questions that might be normally thought of done in economics departments in my, in, in my case. But, you know, in this, I don't think anybody is going to uh, argue, argue with me that industry structure and competition are important, right? But a lot of times in finance, they haven't dealt with that. But I want to say in finance, this is also a very important topic. We're seeing emerging work now in a number of different uh, authors um, in today who are in this area and kind of thinking about these topics, including Song at the end. Uh, we'll talk a little bit. I uh, feature his, his work, recent work, in one of my slides. Um, so competitors are not just benchmarks. And that's what we typically do. Historically, in corporate finance, you say, okay, I've got to find three matching firms in the same industry, and then, you know, then that would be my control set. I could have treated versus control, or maybe you gather all the firms in particular industries, you match. But, you know, then a lot of times people put in um, basically fixed effects. You put in those, and then you're doing this because everyone else is done. So think about why do we put a fixed effect, and what are we trying to control for? That may be, in fact, very interesting, which industry you operate in, and we don't want to put a dummy in for just a fixed effect necessarily. Now, of course, in many applications, it's appropriate. But I, I'm just saying a lot of things you can't do just put in fixed effects. And I think competition is a big thing people are thinking about these days. And it's a fundamental variable that interacts with viable governance structures. There's people, not myself, who've looked at corporate governance and saw and thought about how it in fact impacts, again, uh, you know, competition impacts corporate governance and so forth. And also, you know, again, there's a very nice paper by Giro and Mueller was published in JFT 2010, excellent paper, and it was looking at that very question, and they got two or three two papers on this question. So again, they brought in, instead of just putting the fixed effects in, they looked at competition, measured it, and they were saying, well, if you have a very competitive industry, you don't, in fact, have to worry about agency problems as much, because the product market would discipline the managers, and they showed that indeed was the case. Viable compensation systems. Uh, there's a whole bunch of papers, not mine, that look at compensation, and found that you, can, you pay people differently in competitive versus concentrated industries, and they've explored this theoretically. Finance the new firms and new projects, that's been where I've been working. And we'll show that as impacts they. So the talk, the short talk, will focus on finance and competition, and I need somebody to keep track for it for me, 840. I think I'm going till, till, till 9, and then we'll have three 20 minutes afterwards. All right, so you know, when I say we have a new era of competition in finance, you see in public policy arena, that is, it's a big elephant in the room. The DOJ gets involved, right? But, you know, again, it's, it's really an opportunity for finance scholars to understand 
the trade-offs. So again, I'm just thinking broadly, whatever you're doing, even in asset pricing flows, you're working, there's a bunch of folks who will show how competition affects returns and uh, so forth. But if I do a Google search on competition and lawsuits, I didn't add finance, I get 17 million, eight, 17 million 800 thousand um, uh, results. Um, that's a lot more than if you just put in, you know, again, a, t a typical you know, capital structure, put that in Google search, you'll get a bunch, but you won't get 17 million. Now this doesn't necessarily mean these all deal with finance, but big tech is the subject of, you know, really big lawsuits recently. They're going after some of our tech firms, uh, so forth. Google's trial in the Justice Department now involves 14 states, new lawsuits by 35 states that could all be combined. It's a big issue. Out of 450, this is October 6th of this last year, not this year, 450 page report, 16 month congressional investigation. Big topic. So if you think about what you're working on, it's good to work on big topics. In my opinion, now you could say, well, that's nice to say, but this is a topic that has lots of different, you're not going to work, you know, maybe just take a little slice of it, like one bite of the apple, and you'll find some interesting stuff. Visa <laughs> now uh, purchase a play which is a fintech for H's DOJ scrutiny. The DOJ is starting to get more active. There was a period you know, under the last number of years where the DOJ wasn't as active, so we can have some interesting competitors. Uh, Fortnite creator Epic Games is suing Apple for restraint of trade. Another big one. Now, you say this has nothing to do with finance. Well, I'm going to beg to differ a little bit and, and, and show you finance is important to understanding these questions. And people in economics ignore finance. And so typically, a lot of times in, in finance, people may put in industry fixed effect. They may put an HHI on the right-hand side. That's kind of a, a no-no for many people in economics. But we do it. OK, that would be the extent of it. But here's two views of the world. Big, huge firm is crushing this small. So I said, that's nice. We've got a few pictures here. OK, here's another view of the world. And if you had to label it, oh, wait, there's this big, big firm up top that looking around. Well, well look, look below here, you've got all these small predators out there, uh, small piranhas or something, which are going to think about these are firms who are trying to challenge this big firm. So that's a big question. So competition is still thriving, that's another one. So if you think competition is dead or dying, I've got a couple examples here. Trade Desk, if you've heard about it, it helps uh, companies buy online ads across different platforms. Uh, it, it's, it recently done what others failed, they're eating into Google's share of the market. Okay, Zoom. Everybody knows Zoom now. I thought that was a great example. It really is effectively display Skype, despite Microsoft's huge grill out there with tons of money. And they, they, Skype fell down. That was owned by Microsoft. They owned it for a long time. Microsoft owned it. So what was, this is pretty, pretty interesting, right? TikTok is perhaps, depending on which generation you are, just, just <laughs> starting to displace Facebook. Facebook's value is going way down because of TikTok and you know, some others out there. Online banks are displacing brick and mortar banks. We see this all the time. I don't know how many people use an online bank uh, and don't use you know, Bank of America or Citibank. Uh, you have a whole bunch of online banks. I use them. The key, I think, to understanding the ability for these firms to challenge the entry is financing provided to new entrants. This is what gives the US, in my opinion, a lot of vibrancy. So finance, right there, number one. Can these firms, can these small firms get money? That's a big question. Uh, I don't think it's really been examined anywhere yet to the extent it should be. I'm throwing out a freebie. I may do it myself, so that's, that's I've been thinking about it. Um, but you know, I have a little, a bit off a little bit of this, this topic, but not, it really is, is still open, especially in the context of new firms today. So traditional focus, we know, has been the first two, agency and corporate finance, and asymmetric you know, information. And we think about mechanisms to overcome those problems. Traditionally, as I said, not entry and market coordination problems have been the focus of IO. So central point, I've been repeating myself, and that's a good way in general for these short talks, because if I repeat myself, you'll remember that I'm not really saying anything but like two or three points for the whole thing. So the whole thing is cash flows, which are the focus of the first two, right, are fundamentally affected by product market competition and financing and entry. So researchers need to increase their focus on how these things and you can think about them working through channels of asymmetric information or agency problem. And then it becomes a little bit easier if you send it off to the journal. Um, you know, speak, oh yeah, you've got the agency there, so you're still citing Jensen and Mechanism. That's good. 
Okay. This extra information, you're signing the, you're signing the famous articles, but you're doing with different, different contexts. So what I tell people is how firms interact with each other is important. Firms take actions to impact this interaction. And here's the traditional old style with structural conduct performance. They used to put HHI on the right-hand side, you have some left-hand side variable. People don't do that anymore. What people do is they basically note finance and structure are both, in, both endogenous and the dynamics are important. So now you have to get into it. It's a bit more difficult because you have to think about identification. You have to think about some kind of estimate. How are you identifying it? And that's where I started way back when. And there's a, a very famous bioeconomist from Stanford called Tim Bresnahan. And I used some of his stuff in my thesis. And I, it was hard back then to sell this. I had a hard time on the job market. And I stuck with it because I'm stubborn. Um, and eventually, the world's come around a bit more. But when I started, everybody was doing microstructure. And like 85% of the PhD students when I graduated doing micromarket structure, right? And you could say, well, come on, you know, you went to Harvard, you're not going to have a hard time. I had a hard time doing the job. I had three offers. One was the Fed, and there was two academic offers, and that was it. And one of them was, uh, and I went to Purdue, you know, which is a great place, but um, I, I moved after a while to Maryland, and Maryland was a better place for my work given my frequent co author, Max Maximovich, I'd work with. So I didn't have the ideal fit initially. Another lesson you guys would think about. I took it, I had time to do work, and then I started, I actually had a seminar for the Purdue then, and I, and I invited Max to come talk, because I knew Matt, Max is Maximovich, and I knew he was doing work similar to mine, and preceded mine, and of course I treated him well, we went out to dinner, had lunch, and then he invited me to give a talk in Maryland, and then they made me an offer. So, you know, again, these kind of networking things, who you meet matters. And Purdue is a good place, but it's not one of the places that is on, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the top 20. Uh, you know, so I was just working hard. Next lesson, keep working, and, you know, you never know what happens. But finance and structure are both important, and, you know, this is the new stuff. And it comes out of Shafton Sutton, Sutton, and Sutton is very big in this area. You know, finance and endogenous barriers to entry. And I kept using some of the ideas there. So I, had this, I came up with this thing, MN, MNM for competition in finance. We basically take MNM. Finance doesn't matter for competition if, and of course, there's a bunch of things which you don't think hold true. Competitors do look and get a signal from financial structure. You might take a commitment device which impacts your agency problems with financial structure. So you start thinking about stock prices. Uh, Joel Perez at NCI has a great paper won the best paper prize in general finance in, you know, and that was like 2010, and it was dealing with how competition impacts information, he's a theorist out of NCI, in asset pricing. So he's an asset pricing person, and there's a bunch of others who've worked in that area. So, but, you know, we think competition does matter, and that's what I, hopefully now you can look out and say, okay, okay, it does. Even if you looked at the early work in Telser, 1966, they had this thing called the long purse. Firms would use excess cash to predate to try to get the entrant and small firm to fail and exit. I think uh, Song's work has dealt a little bit with this type of an argument. And he's going to talk after in, in the second half. Bolton and Sharfstein, uh, you know, published ADR in 1990. Entrant may be survived if financiers observe predation and step in to finance the firm. That's what we're just talking about. But again, we haven't seen a lot of work on that last prediction. The, what they were saying is that they were giving the conditions of the reverse when would the big firm be able to keep the little firm out of the market? And uh, because, again, of some agency problems in the firm. So the key is those low profits could be identified as predation, and if the small firm could, in fact, be induced to return profits to the financier. Then the financier would provide money. And see, what was missing for Bolton and Sharstein was the whole idea of venture capital, with venture capitalists would serve on the board. So they would know this is predation. I've got a big deep purse. I've got money, so I can now compete against Microsoft. Right? We still don't know if companies want to enter. We think they do. But you know, it's not quite done. So uh, Laurent Fassard, who became a co-author, has a uh, piece which looked at how large cash holdings in the uh, gaining market share. It was preemptive cash holdings. Now the question is, do entry effects actually affect cash holdings? So he had cash holdings on the right-hand side, like a no-no. But, you know, it's, you know, but again, that was endogenous, but he had some methods with tariff shocks to get around it. But, 
And then I came along, and with uh, my frequent co author, Jerry Holberg and Prabala, and we had something in 2014, 14, and we looked at how the cash holdings were impacted um, by the large firm if they were faced with potential venture capital entry. And that's what we just talked about with the Bolton and Sharf scheme. And we, had a, we came up with a measure of entry threats. So it's how do you get a measure of entry threats when you don't even see it, right? It's a threat. So we said, well, we're going to look at 10K tax, and we actually got the venture capital tax. There is a description, and we looked at the similarity between the venture capital entry and the big firm. And a lot of times the big firm will buy the little firm, but at other times it will survive and threaten the big firm. And so all this data is available if you're interested in this topic. We, uh, with, with another PhD student of mine, Yorgo Sutios, um, we, we examined a question about new products. Does finance impact new products? And if you're public or private? And it does. And I have a recent working paper, if you're still interested, so you say, I've already got, you know, the good thing about doing industrial organization combined with this, so there's lots of different industries, there's lots of different venues out there. And we looked at, in this case, the insurance industry, where we had public and private data, and we looked at some kind of a natural shock and we said, with firms who were previously cash constrained, could they in fact challenge in gaining market share? And if they're able to use derivatives to hedge, we found that they were able to get more financing. This is a recent, recent paper, which we'll probably send out next week. And here's kind of, I got a half a ticket with numbers, but we had pretty strong effects for you know, what happens to market share and market leadership as a function of <coughs> pre event high leverage times you know, this kind of a, a natural shock. Okay, so that's, that's interesting, but what about, that's new product introductions, but all about R&D and VC financing. And here you go again, we're going to look at, we did uh, some text-based measure of looking at how, in fact, um, synergies might be there in, in the case of M&A. And that was, we basically found that competition affects the likelihood of mergers and successful product introduction and competition can affect how gains are shared. Sure. So in all cases of these things, identifying competition means knowing how close and closeness to who. So you have to think about potential competitors. And what we, we've done is, instead of using the standard SIC code, uh, we can get a bit more precise with the text. Now, if you go and do pharmaceuticals like Saw, maybe he'll talk about that afterwards, he could find the competitors because it's a very well-defined industry. But if you're doing something across multiple industries, it's very difficult to find the explicit competitors. So we had to come up with a way because the SIC codes, that's one of my other bugaboos from working on this, are very bad. Um, you can use them, and I've used them before, but if you have a better alternative, you might get sharper predictions. Keep an eye on my time. Okay. Here's another picture. Uh, Disney and Pixar, for example, they didn't even share the same two-digit SIC code. And yet, I think every one of us would realize, hey, these two firms are related. Right? Pixar makes Toy Story for those you have kids, I think cars as well. A couple of the oldest of kids, you've all seen Pixar movies. Disney, we see those, those were made with celluloid. And so the, the way they made these movies were different. So according to the government, they're in different two-digit SIC codes. They happen to share the same one digit, but most firms would class, most studies would classify these as unrelated. So we look at merger games, and this was a very successful merger. They also bought DreamWorks, actually they didn't buy DreamWorks, they bought Marvel, which is 679, which is comics, you know, uh, Disney bought them. So again, what's the lesson here? You get, if you just take the SIC code 679, Disney 737, you say, oh, that's a bad merger, those are unrelated. And yet, there was 25 years of research and mergers just using SIC codes as a measure of relatedness to look at, X, to look at stock returns. So you don't take everything at full face value. In our measure, these were very related to each other, in fact, Pixar was Disney's sixth closest competitor according to textual similarity. And that's very close out of 5,000 firms. And, and it was, and over here, uh, P9 is, that is in fact Pixar's closest competitors. These were them. And then here Disney's, Disney's closest competitors. Again, the SIC goes all over the map because this is kind of, Disney's still kind of old economy, you'd think, but no, it's new economy because they're making computers now with CGI. And yet, because it's CGI, according to the government, they use different inputs. And the SIC codes are made, so all based on the inputs used in the production process. Right? So what's the lesson here? You've got to go behind the standard stuff people do and kind of identify these relations. Right? And so it's so 
And then everybody nods their head afterwards. Oh yeah, that's right, these SIC codes are not very good. But again, I'm telling you, there were hundreds of studies in mergers using SIC codes as related to mergers. And they just accepted it and they found something, but a lot of the conclusions are sharper and some of the conclusions easier to pick up if you measure it more precisely. So it's a little bit of a measurement, but it's also thinking about the economics. I'm not going to go through that table. <clears throat> it just shows you. And then we've done a bunch with that. And then also an R&D and innovation. Here is uh, Song's paper, Killer Acquisitions. So he was doing pharmaceuticals. I don't know how much time I'll talk about your song, but it, it's a recent paper. I recommend it. It's a negative effect of acquisitions in the pharmaceutical industries. We find a positive effect of acquisitions overall on R&D. This one's looking just at what happens after the acquisition. We look at the ex ante effects. So there's still some reconciliation here. And Song's a, Song's a friend, but I was telling him, you know, he's got 6% of firms where maybe there's some negative effects. There's another 94% out there, so I hope he does another paper and shows that maybe there's some small firms which gain from being bought by large firms and are able to bring some products to market because they didn't have the cash. Here's your next paper, so. So maybe you're already working on it. And then we have another paper here recently, a negative view of mergers called Killzone. Platform firms buy small firms to forestall first future competitors in entry. But, you know, we've got Rajan and Zagas, they're going to be pretty, they're going to get this published somewhere. So, but that it gives a wide open win a window here because they're taking such a strong negative view. Personally, I don't believe it's that negative. I believe there's a lot of positives from the MA market. And economists don't believe that, but. Uh, I think there's a lot of positives, and so that's been, it, it opens up room for a debate. That's what's kind of fun. About three minutes, here's research possibilities. Uh, what advice do you give to managers based on competition? You know, if you're, what kind of financial security should you issue? There's a second research possibility. <coughs> do we use cash and other financial policies? It's been partially answered, but you know, again, our changes in industry competition cha uh, correlate with changes in optimal financial and actual financial policies. Again, something which I think is open. There's industry equilibrium models, and people haven't still thought about how financing affects this process of growth, consolidation, stability, and decline. So these are longer run effects. Just three things I've been thinking about. So we have all this data, you may or may not know it, but we, we give away all the other thing you should be able to do today is put your data up, put your programs up. People need to, be, and now the journals require it for rep replicability, and it's even, you have incentives to do it because if you found something interesting, and there could be some other related stuff given the data you might want to look at. So we have all these new measures of concentration. This is all done from papers here. And you can download it and so forth. There's a summary. I think it's a proof. Uh, this, this is the area I've been working in. But you can think of broader, broader speaking, interdisciplinary as a good. Um, if you find something that has impacts across many different subtopics, that is a positive. And then the last thing I'll say is that I have a chapter, if you're interested in this area, I just wrote a chapter and just finished it. It's on my website on SSRN called um, Product Markets Competition and Corporate Connects, a review and direction for future research. So there we go.